Hello, and uh, welcome to today's uh, edition of Inside the Screen Arts Studio. That's the name I gave this. Um, <laughs> I'm your host, <laughs> Sheila Murphy, and James Lipton is not here today because he is uh, an elderly man who does not live in Michigan, and we didn't invite him. Uh, but our guest today <laughs> is um, my friend, which uh, hopefully will be able to be professional, but my friend, um, Javier Grillo Marchois. I, I'm never professional. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Sort of professional. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, who is an uh, award winning creator of television, movies, comics, books, and interactive media. And I'm not going to read his whole bio here. The, the idea is to just kind of have a conversation um, about uh, television, movies, comic books, and interactive media. But Javi's perhaps best known for his work as an Emmy award winning writer producer of Lost for creating the comic book and ABC family television series, The Middleman. Um, I'm, I have no idea, you'll have to tell me what Ramiel Wrath of God is, but <laughs> it sounds okay. very serious. It's very serious, um, yeah. It smells like brimstone. But yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, good. <laughs> yeah. um, so he's uh, done uh, tons of work writing original pilots for network television, working on shows that were existing at the time that he joined them, um, and the range of, of stuff is really wide. So everything from Charlie's Angels, the reboot that didn't quite reboot, yep. um, uh, Medium, The Pretender, Charmed, The Chronicle, Sequest, Jake 2.0, one of my TV boyfriends, um, <laughs> and has worked um, with lots of different really interesting people. He's also done work as a network executive in addition to writing. Um, and while doing all of this work I in television and television writing, he began working in the comic book medium, both for Dark Horse Comics and also for Marvel Comics, and uh, has been kind of exploring writing in that area as well. So I hope you can welcome him with me today to, to our show. Um, and we will uh, talk with Javi about uh, writing and media and all kinds of good stuff. No, it's weird because, you know, because of the internet, and I was sort of on the ground floor of that. I mean, I, yeah. was, I was like in 94 when I was an executive at NBC, there was a big online campaign because, and it's the first time that fans have done a campaign because they thought a show sucked, mm -hmm. right? And it was a campaign because the fans hated Sequest in the second season, so they wanted it to be more like the first season. So th it was like the first organized internet campaign about a show, right? Mm -hmm. And it was literally the Sequest sucks, let's make it better campaign. And I wrote an open letter to them as a network executive, and then that wound up getting quoted, like USA Today did an article about, about it, and it was like this amazing experience of everyone at the network was like, oh my God, this internet thing is really like taking off, you know? Right. <laughs> and, and it was my first indication that you could have some kind of a presence with people. And then I basically retired from the internet because I almost got fired. Um, and then when Lost uh, came on, we had, uh, there, there was a Buffy posting board that people yeah. would communicate with the showrunners on, and the Fuselage, which was the last posting board, was sort of an offshoot of the same people running it and all mm -hmm. that. So I started going in and talking to the fans every day, like around lunchtime, you know, and, and it was one of those things where all of a sudden, like, the fans have this, like, direct access to the people who make the show, and, and, I, and I loved it because I loved talking to the fans in real time and all that, you know, but it, it really was something where you had to be very careful because I wasn't the showrunner. It was Damon's right. show and JJ's show, and 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 they really had secrets and things they wanted to keep and all of that and sometimes they used me as a kind of mouthpiece to the fans but a lot of the times they were like don't get uh, you know whatever yeah, yeah. so it's a weird it's it, it was a weird thing but i feel like in both those occasions i was sort of on the ground floor of what the the what became the norm for how fans interact with executive producers and writers and things like that you know one of the things that i i learned early on was the whole idea of spoilers which mm -hmm. um used to be less reliable mm -hmm. before the internet got as big as it yeah. is uh, they weren't you know like you could you'd hear lots of different stuff about shows and then mm -hmm. um you know most of it was not true and mm -hmm. now most of them are pretty yeah. right on and i i am a, i am super anti-spoiler if, if, if it's See, a show I, I'm, I'm really into i'm i'm no. a promiscuous spoiler i believe really? in spoilers well first of all you're I'm all so let down no everybody's spoiled <laughs> okay first of all how many hours of tv have you watched in your life Let's not talk about that. All right, I'm just saying <laughs> there is no possible outcome that we as a writer's room can come up with that you could not potentially predict just from having watched TV. Well, you know? yeah, there's that. I mean, it's, it's like literally you're pre-spoiled. You, you, know, you know, having spent your childhood watching TV as I did, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, yeah, you, you get involved with the character. I mean, our trick is to make you forget that you know every possible outcome for a show. Right. You know, um, and, and, and that's sort of, that's what we try to do narratively is try to keep you from figuring it out before we actually spring it on you. And if usually if we're five seconds away from you, 
uh, like in terms of in terms of you going, oh, this is gonna happen, that's gonna happen, yeah. oh, that happened, and if we're like five seconds ahead, we're we're batting a thousand, you know, uh, that's a sports metaphor. I got that. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I hate sports. Surprising, like I never make yeah. sports metaphors. Ann Arbor's a weirdly magical place. I mean, like, I mean, yeah, honestly, it's yeah. it's 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 <laughs> odd to find a city that has this level of support. A city this size, obviously because of the university, that has this level of support for the arts and and all of that. So it's right. and that was a huge part of you know my growing up experience was living in Ann Arbor and ha be having access to this community and 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 that kind of support. I mean, it's a pretty amazing thing. You can have every method about writing or any method that you want, but if you're going to write, you're going to write. The, if you want to be a writer, you have to you have to get to the point where you have written. When I when I applied for USC graduate school, the thing that I realized that they were really looking for in their applications wasn't how many extracurricular activities I had. Mm -hmm. It was, do you have the wherewithal to bring a project to completion? And that is actually th the thing that I've realized is probably the single most important thing about all creative endeavor. It's that it's not about having ideas. It's not about starting stuff. It is about, do you, is, if, if it's at two in the morning, if it's wh whenever, it's like, do you get it done? And I think we do have a question from yes. the audience. Yeah, um, I'm just curious if the uh, structure of your writing, storytelling, changes if you move from like a comic, writing a comic book, or mm -hmm. writing to, for television, if the st actual structure of it changes. You know, with 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 some of the comic books I've done, I wrote them as like the middleman was a pilot, so so the artist took that pilot and we decided that every act was going to be an issue, and then he kind of created the the layouts for it and 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 all of that based on that. When I moved, uh, I did a, a a series of books for Marvel. Um, and they insisted that I work in the comic book format, so I had to learn how to write comic books. And then that was that. And then I realized that you know when you're writing a comic book, it's actually a really different format because, what you know, I in a comic book format, you're writing you know page one, and then you write everything that's on that page, and you have to direct all the shots and say how many panels are on the page and all that. And what I realized was that there's actually a trick to doing that, th and it's basically you have to end every page of a comic book on a question, not like a physical question, but like a dramatic question, an emotional mm -hmm. question, something that's going to make the person turn the page. And when I realized that, everything about how I wrote comic books for Marvel changed, you know. Um, so, so, so that's so that's one way that it's that that you realize it, it is a very different format. When, when I'm writing feature films, um, I there's a, there's a very different narrative expectation than from a TV show. But certain things that I that I started in TV shows actually take into feature films. Like, you know, a TV show every 15 minutes you're building to a narrative climax because you're going to cut to a commercial break, right? So. In my in my feature writing, I actually still look at it as I was taught in, in film school. You know that the sequences every film has, you know, a two sequence first act, a four sequence second act, and a two sequence third act. So you're always trying to build to a narrative climax at the end of every sequence, especially if you're writing a genre project or an action movie or a horror movie that requires that the audience will be on the edge of their seat. So that's something that I actually I didn't really understand until I went to TV and I had to deal with act breaks, and then I took that into my feature writing. I'm a big fan of the series Lost, and um. What's unique about it, you know, is how the story is told through flashbacks. Mm -hmm. And right now I'm contemplating writing a story mm -hmm. that centers around flashbacks. But, you know, as a screenwriter, you're always told, um, you know, to stay clear of flashbacks because mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, and I was just w was looking for some advice as to how I should approach that. Well, um, I had a writing teacher. I, I went to undergraduate at Carnegie Mellon University, and I had a writing teacher named Theodore Wiesner uh, who, who gave me the greatest piece of advice about writing that I've ever gotten. And that piece of advice was, Good writing is whatever you can get away with, you know, and, and, and I honestly believe that, you know, there, there's no, you know, people can tell you stay away from flashbacks. Don't, you know, honestly, the, 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 the sheer measure of it is does it work or doesn't it work? And you can only accomplish, you know, uh, know that, you know, you can only accomplish proof of concept or proof of lack of concept by trying to execute what you're trying to do, you know. And the truth of the matter is, you know, flashbacks are not exactly a new story. To, I mean, they, they obviously didn't begin with Lost and they didn't, you know, end with Lost. Um, I mean, the Canterbury Tales is a flashback story, you know. So, so you literally, you know, it, it just literally has to be not I want to do a, a, a script with flashbacks, but rather um, are flashbacks the best tool to tell the story? You mentioned that guy, well, you go on telling people that you did grad studies in screenwriting. And God, that sounds so, 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 so disreputable. You go around telling people. <laughs> no. But I know the truth! No, I, I heard you actually did yeah. it. There <laughs> was an itinerant <laughs> Russian milkman. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh. No, but, you know, people would say, nobody cares, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, for us, like, we're in undergrad, what would you, like, give as advice for us mm -hmm. um, to get the most out of our undergrad experience? Mm -hmm. um, not in terms of, like, words on a page, but stuff that actually will improve our, like, mm -hmm. experience in the actual industry. Well, you know, here's the thing. I think that 
you know, what happens, what happens is you, you go to undergraduate, and then maybe you do grad school, maybe you don't. Then you have to move to L.A. And L.A. is a beast. It's a disaster area. I mean, it's horrible. There's fires, there's earthquakes, there's riots. I mean, it's like living in the Old Testament. It's, it's, it's horrible, you know. And there's no public transportation, so you have to buy a car. It's warm. Uh, it is warm. <laughs> It's too warm, though. Yeah, like, it's yeah true, I couldn't yeah. wear this shirt in it, LA. Yeah, it's not no, like, you know, whatever. No. Uh, you know, it would look like I've been left out in the rain. <laughs> anyway, the point being, so then you move out to LA, and your first year in LA, or two years even, are going to be about learning how to use LA and survive in LA. You know, so you can pretty much kiss the idea of, of having that writing job goodbye unless you're very lucky. I mean, uh, everybody's mileage will vary, but by and large, beginning a career in the entertainment industry means you move out to LA. You get, you know, you, you maybe have a, con a contact from an internship that you've done and you get a PA job or you get an assistant mm -hmm. job if you're really lucky because those are really hard jobs to get. And then you slowly kind of learn how to live in the city and how to use it. And it's a actually a really great city. It's, 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 it's the Old Testament, but it's, it's not Leviticus, you know. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's fine. I mean, it's a, you, you, if they let me in, they'll let you in. I mean, it's going to be okay. But you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like and then you start meeting people. And then, you know, your, your peer group becomes people who start getting assistant jobs or you get an assistant job and then you help your friend get an assistant job. And then if you're a writer, hopefully, while well you've been learning how to survive the, the riots and the earthquakes and the fires, then maybe like you've written a bunch of scripts and then, you know, your friend becomes an assistant to an agent and, and they read your script and they like it and they say, well, I'll give it to the agent, you know. That's how those jobs happen. I mean, they're really about... You know the weird thi the, the 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 weird thing is is that there's no one way of 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 getting that entertainment industry career. It is really about the commitment, not just to writing, not just to art, but to just going to this weird, foreign, awful city, learning how to live there, and surviving long enough till somebody gives you a break of some kind. You know. Well, thank you very much. I think we're about ready to uh, wrap it up. To run here. screaming. Yeah. No. <laughs> hopefully they won't run screaming, but we really. I would. <laughs> thank you. I don't we really appreciate your time today uh, here with us in, uh, in the Screen Art Studio. So thank you. Thank you all very much. Yeah. That was great.